Well, Kathy, it's great to be with you, and I'm really very happy to be part of this group. I'm looking forward to a terrific conversation this afternoon. Thank you, Secretary Kendall. We're so excited to be here. I'm Kathy roth -Duquet. I'm the founder and CEO of Blue Star Families. And our mission is to make sure that military-connected families thrive to enhance readiness, retention, recruiting, to help national security, and to make American communities stronger. And so the experience of women in the military is really important to us. We were founded by women. We had female veterans and National Guard and reservists among those who started with us. And through our surveys, which we do every year, we've seen the experience of women in uniform. We've seen it get better. And um, Secretary Kendall, I have to really thank you for the um, attention that you've given to this matter. And the, the Air Force has really led. We are a purple organization, all ranks and services, all um, military services. And we have with us today all military services. But when the Air Force leads, others follow. And um, I'm going to mention some stats, but we're looking forward to seeing how they have changed, may, may have changed in the future as we're catching up to some of these um, improvements that have been made. For instance, we know that women are half the talent in America, so they need to be in our military, right? But women are less likely to be encouraged to serve. Um, and once they are in, we are finding that they have different experiences, and often they feel that they're, in fact, 75% of them experience what they feel is gender discrimination or you know, issues with command climate which leads them, those who have that, lead them to not recommend service to either men or women. So it's important for us to address these um, to make a difference. We're seeing heightened challenges with childcare, heightened challenges with um, uh, the ability to manage um, uh, life, res life responsibilities that come with disproportionately with women. But we all know that those things can actually be addressed so that they make the service stronger. So we're we're so excited to be here today. I, I actually get to introduce the secretary, who I think needs no introduction. But I do want to say that we've known you for many years. And not all um, national security leaders recognize that personnel is as central as troop movements and um, training and hardware. But um, the software is behind our strength. Um, and I do appreciate the way you've led on that issue. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, it's great to be with you all. Uh, I've gotten to thinking about my own background in my career. I've been around for several decades now. And uh, a lot of that time spans uh, the continuing journey of, of for women and men, uh, but particularly for women in the military. And I thought back to my own initial experience was, of course, as a cadet at West Point, which at the time was an all-male school. I graduated in 1971, and I came back just a few years later 1977 uh, to teach. And by then, women had been introduced into the academy. And I was teaching the first uh, sophomore class with women. So I had some classes with all men and some, some with women. And at the time, I felt that we had done a pretty good job of integrating women into the, into the academies. I was a coach of a team as well as an ac uh, ac academic instructor. Uh, at about that same time frame, I went to one of my early professional development classes. And I was an Army Air Defense officer. And the very first woman to be an Army Air Defense Officer was in the class with me. I was a class leader because I got there a little late because I went to grad school. And she came from another branch, and she was also a first lieutenant like I was. So I got to see uh, her style of leadership and how effective that could be. Uh, we've come a long way from then. It's 50-odd years since then. But as I sit in my position today, we're still wrestling with issues associated with women in the military. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples, we're talking about flying while pregnant and what, what our rules should be to give women some agency and some latitude to do what they need to do for their career, but also uh, to address any concerns or risks they might have. So we're, we're wrestling with that. We're wrestling with getting uniforms right for people to have flight suits that they can wear when they're pregnant. Um, we're looking at you know making our career fields more representative. We've done a lot of work on disparities. Kathy, as you know well, uh, to try to make sure that people from different groups are treated fairly and equitably in the, in the service. And we're not quite where we need to be on some of those things. So I'm very interested in hearing your experiences, uh, how, how the service has affected you. You know, when I think about my own experiences, which go back quite a few decades, um, more than I like to admit, the, uh, I, I was involved in some of the very early expansions of the roles of women in the military. I went through West Point when it was still an uh, all-male school. Uh, came back a few years later as an instructor, and by then women had entered the academy, 
the first year I was there teaching, they were sophomores and were working their way up through the classes. But I also had the chance to not only give academic instruction, but also be a coach for an athletic team that included women. And I thought at the time that the academy actually did quite a good job of, of integrating women. All the academies did at the same time. But it was a major change, and that's almost 50 years ago now. Uh, I was in an early class at, uh, I was an air defense officer in the Army. And when I went through some of my early training uh, in that specialty, the very first woman air defense officer was a member of my class, which was otherwise all male, except for one person. And she, like myself, uh, did that training a little bit later than normal. So we were both first lieutenants and were leaders of the class. And it was interesting to see her leadership style and how the, that, that was all adopted. And you would think that given that it's been about 50 years that we would have solved all the problems associated with having a, a, a male and female force, but we have not. Uh, we're still dealing with some of those problems today. Um, flying while pregnant is one, and what exact rules to have as we expand the rules there. We've been working recently on flight suits for women who are pregnant, uh, to, and we were not doing a very good job there. So there's still a lot of things that I think we have to work through, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your perspective on those as we have our conversation today. That's super, Mr. Secretary. Well, let me introduce our um, panelists. Um, we're so delighted to have uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Olivia Nunn, who is uh, recently retired from the U.S. Army, um, uh, served uh, at Soldier for Life for many years, uh, was a partner with Blue Star Families then, and now is uh, in her retirement, is often volunteering with us and doing other things in the community. Ashley Seville, um, daughter of a dual um, Air Force Senior Master Sergeant couple, Marine Corps veteran, and currently active duty spouse of a Marine Corps active duty officer, um, and uh, a, a mom, and soon to be a new mom. Um, really delighted to have um, Brigadier General Deborah Lovett with us um, from the Air Force, and she's director of the Department of Air Force's Integrated Resilience Office, and Colonel Laura Walsh from Space Force. So amazing to have Space Force with us. Um, is currently U.S. Space Force Chair to the National Defense University. Um, so thank you for joining us to have this important discussion about how we make our military stronger. One of the things we say in Blue Star Families is as much as it's a pleasure and a privilege to serve our country, which it is, no one is going to choose to do that job if it hurts their family. And this is something that hits military um, uh, women in uniform as much, if not more, as men in uniform. And as we work to solve these problems, we're, we're just making the service stronger. Um, so uh, with that, um, we just have a few questions for you. And I'd like to start with just asking each of you, were there female leaders, female military leaders that inspired you in your journey into the military? Start over here. There, there weren't for me. My, you know, my story is that I was in a military family and my father was serving. So for me, um, it was really male leaders early on. So both my father serving and, and even when I first joined the Air Force, I think you know the first person that I would consider a mentor or somebody I looked up to um, was my first lieutenant a crew commander when I was a missileer. Um, but I think that's important too, right? Because women and men can have women and men as mentors. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also an important point that any position, any rank um, can be a mentor if you're investing in somebody and helping bring somebody along with you. Yeah, that's really striking. How about you, Olivia? I, I would probably have to echo a lot of what Colonel Walsh was saying is, um, you know, I, and first generation Korean American, and my father served in the army. He was enlisted combat engineer, and um, you know he's been very vocal that, as as you know, daddy's little girl, don't ever let that hold you back as a woman. And um, I knew since the age of four that I wanted to be in the army. What I was going to do, what I was going to be, I had no idea. Um, but the one thing was, uh, he said that you had to go to school. You know, being Asian, education was important, and he did not want me to enlist. He wanted me to be an officer. Again, I had no idea what that was going to be. The end state was the Army. And so that's, I knew that's what I was going to do. But in terms of women inspiration, there there really wasn't. I commissioned in 2001, and there really wasn't. And I found myself in combat engineer, with, you know, not just with, um, you know, combat engineers or infantry and armor, but I found myself in the world of, combat arms, that's where I served, and that is dominated by men. And so left and right was men. Oftentimes I was the only woman, so there wasn't a lot of inspiration 
for women, for me to say, hey, keep doing this. But I was fortunate of having men leaders that said that you are here, you should be here. Yeah. But you powerful, know. powerful story about yeah. allies, right? Yeah. And, and I, I think that yeah. is so important. Deborah? Yes, ma'am, thank you. That's a great question. Um, I did not um, grow up as a military uh, child moving around, yeah. but my dad retired and we stayed in place. I got all of his stories and, and all of his uh, friends that he had made, his connections throughout his military career. Um, and I think that really planted a seed for me that I wanted to join a community like that. Um, but he oddly didn't expect me to want to join the military, didn't encourage it at all. Um, he encouraged my brother because I think he had maybe the traditional mindset of, you know, the, the men will go off to the military and the women will do something else. Um, so I ended up applying to the Air Force Academy without his knowledge. And so he was a little shocked when he discovered that I was well into the process and, um, and selected for, for the school, uh, after which he became very supportive, of course. He was like, okay, well, if this is what you want to do, let's go. Um, but my, uh, my female inspirations, I think, like the others, I, I can't think of one that I, that I can associate with this process at all. Um, and throughout my career, most of my mentors have been men. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, uh, it's encouraging because it is true, you can mentor, it doesn't matter what the gender. Right. It's important that we share this with everyone so that we get the, the best possible leadership combination that we can get. Um, but that's, that was a lesson for me so that I, I had to incorporate this into my own mentoring program, not just focusing on women, but but sharing it with everyone that I could. Um, because when we all get better, it's, it's you know, the readiness question that you bring up, right? We all get better and then contribute better to national security. So. Powerful and positive story. Um, Ashley? Yeah, so I would say uh, because my parents were both in the service as dual master sergeants, I, I was always around to it. Like, it was exposure, um, especially living off bases. A lot of my mother's friends were also women. So I always saw it. I fought going into the military. My parents were like, oh, you should do an ROTC scholarship. I was like, I'm not doing this. I would definitely wanted to go more. Um, Condoleezza Rice was my, uh, I would say, idolization at that time. Um, so I did not um, commission traditionally. It wasn't until my brother, who served as an Apache pilot in the Army, um, was my decision to kind of like, I'm going to one-up my brother and go in the Marine Corps. <laughs> um, so shortly after that and at the basic school is where I kind of found more of the mentorship. So, you know, the Marine Corps is unique and every Marine officer is a rifle platoon commander. And so I got to see whether it was infantry, logistics, um, public affairs, you see a variety of leaders, um, both men and women. So that's a lot where my inspiration and mentorship came from. I'm curious about motivation and um, You've all had a fair amount of experience, so there's been some time since you came into the military. But you, you had certain motivations at that time, and you've had a lot of experience now with the military. So I'm curious about what brought you in and whether you found what you were looking for and what you would say to young people today who were thinking about it in terms of the reasons why you might consider a career or, or just some service in the military as a woman. So I think, sir, the things that brought me in Growing up in a military family, I, I kind of got to see my dad live it, but I, I was interested in what I saw, the camaraderie, um, living in different places, being able to do different jobs, always having the different change, working with people from across America, and serving the country. I, I was definitely called to serve. And then I think what's you know kept me in has been finding those things and the continued challenges along the way and be able, being able to help other people as I've risen through the ranks, bring people with me. Okay, great. I think it's a huge tie to culture. The Asian culture is about service mm -hmm. and it's about pride to the nation mm -hmm. and to duty and honor to your family. Mm -hmm. And that's big. And my dad embodied that and I'm the oldest. And so it was just an, a natural tie. Yeah. Um, and what kept me in is it's family. Hmm. It's just a natural tie to family. The people have emphasized, particularly in the Air Force, and I say this to some degree from my Army experience, 
you know, the, 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 the society that you join, the family, the community that you join, right? So you got some very some pragmatic and aspirational things mixed in there together. Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Secretary, it's, it's uh, about that community, in fact, for me, that was the initial kind of the camaraderie that I saw with my my father and um, and all of his friends and the stories that came from it seemed very exciting to me when I was younger. Um, they also built in a very strong sense of patriotism and service to country and I thought um, perhaps this would be the way that I could serve as well. Um, I did not come in thinking I would stick around for an entire career, certainly as long as I've been in, because I've been in a few decades myself, sir. Um, um, but Every time uh, an opportunity would arise, I would ask myself, am I still excited about this opportunity? Do I still think I have a, uh, something that I can contribute to this, either organization or this operation or whatever the case is, and I'm, am I still having fun? And uh, all these questions I had to answer for myself each time, and each time I said yes, and so I would continue, and then here I sit 20 plus years later um, and still thrilled to have the opportunity to work with the kind of people, the family that I've picked up mm -hmm. along the way, which I, I know I would not have uh, any other way. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was called to serve. I was working at an organization as a sales rep and I saw family members. My brother particularly was going off to Iraq and I was like, I can affect some change and how I was going to affect it. So I was really just called to serve for tradition. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Well, great, great reasons all the way across. Not the same necessarily, but uh, very good ones. Thank you. Yeah, and, and continuing on with the idea of service, we talked about recruiting, but you know, one of the things our recent survey, our 2020 survey showed was that women were significantly more, women in our survey were significantly more likely than the men to say that they were planning on leaving in the next two years. So regardless of where they were in their career progression, women were more likely to leave before retirement than men. So what do you think the barriers are for women staying in and progressing in leadership in the military. Why do women leave more, are more likely to leave earlier than men? And I wonder, Deborah, if you have any thoughts about that. I do, yes ma'am. As a brand new mom, <laughs> I'm feeling that conflict right now. Um, but I certainly understand that there are um, choices that have to be made in, in, in a, an evolution of a, of a, of a career. Um, and I personally think you know, sometimes there's situations where you're forced into this decision um, based on the circumstances, the context that you have. And sometimes that is policy driven. Although the DAF, the department has done a great job at examining just that, the, the barriers, those things that create the conflict um, that end up presenting a, a binary decision for, for an active duty member. And we're trying to reduce the amount of times that we put members in those positions where they have to choose between service and family, let's say, if that's the example. Um, and if it's, and it doesn't mean just having kids, it could mean taking care of aging parents, it could mean some, something else completely. Um, but if we can find those places where we're forcing those decisions, then perhaps we have an opportunity to uh, make the situation uh, in such a way that the, the decision doesn't have to mean that you depart the service, you can and serve at the same time. It's right. not an either or. Right. Um, and, and I think that tends to be kind of the discussions that I have with people who are thinking of getting out or separating or retiring. Uh, it's usually a decision that they have to make based on a, a, a value proposition. Which one can I afford to give my time to? And if forced by um, maybe a PCS that is unplanned or perhaps a promotion that didn't happen or something that isn't working right. with their particular decision-making analysis, then, um, then it becomes very difficult to retain right. someone like that. Yeah, if, if, if structural things get in a way. So I'm thinking about um, the Air Force's recent policy to allow women, to put, uh, women in uniform who have recently had children to put off a deployment for a year. You know, how much are you preserving the force by making structural changes like that? Is a, right? I, I, uh, uh, Laura, what are your thoughts? So I have I have many of the same thoughts, um, and I'm I'm a member of the DAF WIT, who has you know definitely done a lot of work to to ID some of the barriers and try to knock down as many of the challenges as we can. Uh, but I do think it's about 
really fundamentally understanding what some of the challenges are. You know, we know childcare is one and it's a tough problem. Um, and, you know, I think not everybody has a, a, a solution for it, but when we work together, I think we can work on some solutions for these problems. Something else that we know with women is that as a percentage, um, there are more female members in the service that have dual military relationships. I'm a army wife myself, um, and there are there are a lot of challenges there with with maintaining this marriage, with maintaining childcare when we're stationed in two different places. So the more things that the the military can put into place um, to support, you know, the the, the better off we're going to be for taking care of our people and keeping people in, and and both women and men. You know, the demographics are changing a lot. Uh, you know, we are finding that there are there, that these problems are also impacting men. So right. it's it's something that has to be looked at uh, for both sides. Yes, I, that's right. And and speaking of dual military, um, uh, Ashley, you were part of a dual military yes. couple, and you chose to separate. I did. Um, so I wonder what your thoughts are. I, I, well, now they're not as relevant as they were when I was making that decision because the changes that are in place. Um, but I think a lot. They would have made a difference. It for would have you. made a difference at the time. I um, mean, I can't say that I would have done 20 years, but I at least would have extended to the next duty station and seen, you know, kind of what that would have brought opportunity wise. But a lot of the reasons I did decide to separate when I did was really opportunity and the cross section of, oh, are we going to be at Camp Pendleton, Camp Lejeune, or like, what were we going to do? And, and what changes would have made, kept you in? What specifically could you point specifically to? Specifically the maternity policy now, and even the paternity policy now, which I think mm -hmm. is huge transformational, especially someone that is going to be having welcoming a new little one. And the fact that my husband can now take 12 weeks is just... We just changed it. Phenomenal. Just changed it. Like, changed it during your... During my maternity leave. <laughs> yeah, so Is thank right? you, sir. I greatly <laughs> appreciate Good, good that. timing. Huh? Just in time yeah. inventory. <laughs> it, it made a huge difference for well, me, me personally. Let me piggyback on this a little yeah. bit. It's an interesting topic. Um, I was going to ask, what, what has changed the most for the better since you entered the service, perhaps? And what needs to change the most going forward? What, what, what opportunities do we have to really improve things? Do you, you want to start? Sure. Um, I think the representation has changed a lot, and I think yeah. that matters. Um, so the demographics are changing, starting you to no match. You no longer have one person in the class. You have right. a significant fraction, right? Right. Yes, sir. You know, thinking about when, when you asked me the mentor question, you know, I didn't have a female supervisor until I was 10 years into the military. Mm -hmm. And even then, I didn't have my second female supervisor until I was another 10 years in. Um, so it's important. You know, you hear the you hear the saying, um, you've got to see it to be it. So I think the demographics changing is huge. Um, acknowledging how hard some of these challenges are and then seeing senior leadership engage is very important to keeping people in. And then I think going forward, we have to continue to think about it as not just accommodation, but like true integration. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what that means. And I think it means more than just policy changes you have to get after the culture. And, and we know that. We know there's more work to do. Um, but just because the policy changes doesn't mean that the culture changes. Talk about the culture a little bit more, more specifically, if you could. Okay. What needs to change in the culture? I, I, I do believe there's a lot of uh, bias that's still in the system, You know, whether it's gender, racial, mm -hmm. um, pregnancy biases, maternal biases. And, and some of it is conscious, but I think a lot of it, you know, are the unconscious biases. And I don't know what the solution is, but I think it's talking about the problems, mm -hmm. probably doing more training. Um, but the culture is something that we know we still need to, to, to tackle. I, I echo a lot of that. In fact, we had a conversation before the recording um, earlier. It, diversity has changed a lot. Um, it, you know, we're seeing a growth, one of the fastest growing demographic in the military is women. We have more women that are joining the forces and I think that that's huge. And I think we're gonna continuously see that trend. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, the fact that women get to do everything now, mm -hmm. right? When I came in in 2001, I wanted to be a tanker. 
eh, wah, wah. That was not available to me, <laughs> right? Marvelous, I mean, who right. who did not want to send the biggest round down range and blow things up? Um, <laughs> you know, but unfortunately, like that was, you, yeah, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, that was not an option for me. But today, that is, if, if a, a woman wanted to enlist right now, they can absolutely do that. If they wanted to be special forces, you know, a SEAL, by all means, they can do that. And I think that is amazing. However, let's be very honest. We still have to have the conversation about systemic racism within our ranks. And not just the conversation, but how do we tackle it and how do we get after it? We still have mental health crises going on within our ranks and we need to do something about it. And it's not just talking about it and doing something, but the conversation that I think we need to have is um, how do we get after shaping the conversation about how do we grow the ranks of women leadership and help women leadership grow through the ranks? Mm -hmm. And what I was talking about was I felt like men really wanted women to be successful, but they didn't know how to help me. Mm -hmm. And when I was turning inward, I felt like that the men didn't want me there. But the truth was they did want me there. They just didn't know how to help me mm -hmm. because I the, the lack is that they didn't know how to help me. The training isn't there for men to actually help me. So I think the lack, the lack of training is that men don't know how to help women effectively. I'm a man. Could you help me a little bit yeah. to understand? It's, and I, yeah, we're starting to. I'm, we're starting to see comment. the shift, right? Because um, we're having that conversation. That conversation wasn't there before. Yeah. And now we're starting to have that conversation. Because when you have that conversation with men, when you ask that simple conversation, do you want, especially if you ask a father, would you want your, if you have a daughter, would you want your daughter to have every opportunity to succeed? Sure. And their natural answer is, why yes. So then why would you not want your female counterparts to miss any opportunity. And when you ask them that question, they're like, well, I wouldn't want them to. Well, then why do you treat them in a certain way? Well, I didn't realize that I was. Mm. So that tells me it's because there's a lack of training for them. It's a, and it's some biases. It's the way that it's always been done. It's mm. the vernacular, right? It's you hit like a girl, you run like a girl. So those things have to be undone and then taught in a different way. And that's the training set that we've got to do to yeah, go that's forward. That's a great, very insightful comment. I think like the policy and culture is kind of goes to the exact point that you're making because policy, culture can follow policy and policy can follow culture. And I think a lot of the documents and really infrastructure publications that are coming out now are getting around some of those topics. And I'm like, I say again, if this was around 10, 15 years ago, maybe it would have changed that decision. When you look at things like Talent Management 2030, that really speaks to honing in on individuals and specifically services um, on what the capabilities can be for those servicemen and women. It is encouraging to hear that we've changed enough to have made Too a difference, now, yeah. <laughs> you know, for this one here. Um, but I think that's one of those uh, positives about the Air Force. It just seems that it's a little more open mm -hmm. to um, the evolution of human uh, nature. And I think there's even more to come. I, I think this is not, this isn't a finish line we're ever gonna really reach. This is a journey we're gonna be on for a long time. Because as you all know, family structure alone has changed over the last several decades mm -hmm. and now might mean something completely different Although our policies may not exactly have it right now, they're going to adjust probably to accommodate new family structure, new family dynamics that are happening that we just didn't have in the 1960s or 70s at that time. Um, and I have to applaud the Air Force for uh, being open. I applaud the, the, the barrier analysis working groups and the, the willingness to listen to what is being brought forward by these teams. These are the people who are living it. And if they hadn't been heard, then I wouldn't have had the extra maternity leave um, that was so very precious and valuable at the time uh, that, I, that I needed. And so um, just a lot of kudos to the, to the institution for listening. We've got a long ways to go, but we're doing-, we're doing I, I would that. agree with both of those and you, you can comment on this, but the- um, um, there is a growing recognition and awareness, but it's largely a result of the demographic changes, that there are more women at the, in the room to speak up. One of the things that we found very interesting is that um, on promotion boards, we, we've tried to be more representative on our promotion boards, for example, uh, but we had a comment early on that when we had two women on a board, 
we will get much richer and more fuller discussion about people when there's a limited time to do this, but um, as opposed to having one. And you have that reinforcing voice in the room with you, right? So, you know, tokenism doesn't get it. You've got to really have real representation, I think, to, to have that voice heard. And I, I will say from my perspective, having been through quite a few decades of this and two service cultures at least, is that it is happening, it is changing. The things that you're talking about, Deborah, are occurring. And people are having a much richer understanding across these boundaries, I think, of, of different perspectives and different experiences. But I agree with you also, we still have a long way to go. We're not there yet by any means. So speaking of the long way to go, I'm gonna, my last question is an, an inspirational and aspirational question. If, if, if you were the Air Force Secretary yeah. in an alternative universe where the Air Force Secretary was all powerful yeah. <laughs> and money was no object, what one policy change would you make to really improve the ability to recruit and retain women talent and leadership? This is a million dollar question, ma'am. I gotta tell you, I, I think I would make it so that you could flow without issue between a flexible part-time situation and a permanent situation or a civilian situation or whatever you needed to to shape it around the circumstance that you were in so that you could still contribute. This is, we're working on parts and pieces of this. It's just very difficult to do. Yeah. But if we could have that and then um, enable, enable those choices to be a little bit easier, then Potentially, we could retain the talent in some form, yeah. whether it's a part-time form or a civilian form or other. Um, so I think I might do something along those lines. Anyone else? I, I think I'm with a general on that one. Um, but the other one that always you know, comes up as a biggie is child care, mm -hmm. and, and that's across the force. Yeah. So are you asking from a recruiting standpoint? Because now I'm the trying to get thing. into the 21-year-old line of Ashley. Okay, you can yeah. pick your own. Anything you can pick you your own. If yeah. you wanted Wide to be recruiting, make it that. One thing, guy's the limit. I think it would be, and it's probably along the same lines as General Lovett, but really about the exposure of what life could be 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Because you only see things as like second lieutenant, more at that time. And that was very binary. You're like, you're going to get a platoon, you get a platoon, like, and that's it. But if you knew what the capabilities were, it's the FAO, RAO program. It, I think those things really would make a difference in your career progress. Yeah. I think it's career progression, like deconstructing, you know, obviously my mindset is from, from an army progression, but deconstructing in a way where it's more of a flow status, um, where it's not a linear structure where you have to do this to get to this to get to this. It's more of how do we flow from a structure where you can grow in a mindset holistically to be a full leader in every aspect from education, um, seeing what your counterparts are doing and on a civilian side. How do you how do you grow as a leader because you have you know childcare issues, right? Or you have aging parents. Um, but at the same time, you can go into academia and still come back and not feel like you're missing the gates. Oh, but if you are the woman in the, in the uh, relationship, you can actually have children and come back and not feel like you've missed a beat in your, um, in your career. You know, all these things, uh, I think for me, I felt like was difficult in my 20 years. It's like you had to do these things. And that's why I ended up being an older mom because I wanted, I had to put what I felt like was my career first right. um, because I had to do these things because I wanted company command. I wanted to do these things. And while being an older parent is, you know, I, I think you can attest to that, ma'am, is there's greatness to that, but then there's some not so greatness being an older parent. I have an um, eight year old. I can identify with that. <laughs> Right? It's a little well, you know, I'm going to jump on the child care thing because I think if we had if we had an enemy that was threatening the force that had the impact on retention and numbers, mm. if we had a piece of equipment that was missing or a technology, we would pour money into it. We have an ARPA to get innovation there, but we need an ARPA for personnel. We need a PARPA because we can solve this childcare problem. It is a human problem that is solvable. And I actually even have ideas. We're just not willing to look at it as the same level of problem. But in fact, it's causing the American taxpayer 
and our national security as much risk. That's a good point. Thanks. Um, what message would you all like to deliver to the men in the force? What do the men in the force need to understand that they don't? That allyship is important. Yeah. Allyship is important mm -hmm. and that their voice at the table is important. Mm -hmm. That just because we're asking for a seat at the table doesn't mean that they should leave the table. And that if, and, and I know it's such a cliche when we say, hear something, do something, but we really need you to lead the way in that. Mm -hmm. um, and when we say change vernacular, when I said earlier about the whole run like a girl, hit like a girl, yeah. What I'm seeing is that when you, when people say that, when men say that, you're seeing that I'm less than, and that, yeah. that is not right. And so when we start changing up here that thought process, then you're saying that we are your partner in this. That's great. And that is important. And so we need you to help us lead that charge because we are 50% of the force. We are a force multiplier with you. We're not asking to take over from you. We are partners in this. And when we do that, we can go so much farther. You have just set a very high bar for my question. <laughs> Does anybody have anything else that they want to add on that topic? So, sir, I might add that we're making all of these policy changes, um, laying in significant change, uh, which is great because we're allowing for um, many, many things that, that create a more inclusive environment. What I would ask is for genuine support of these particular things in order to make them really effective for the people that are going to use the policies, uh, the, the individuals, and, I, and I, I speak from very recent experience on the mom piece, the mom guilt is very real. It's already very powerful. Mm -hmm. So if I'm not performing at work, it's compounded 10 times over already, right? So I don't necessarily need to make it harder for these individuals who are already trying to, to fit back in. Um, but if they could maybe be a little bit more uh, um, thoughtful, maybe, in how we manage these and welcome these policy changes, mm -hmm. maybe even more vocally than they normally would be, then um, that might be helpful just to enable the use of these policies. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, um, Ashley, Deborah, Laurel, Olivia, thank you so much for coming and joining us today. Um, Secretary Kendall, thank you for inviting us to celebrate Women's History Month with you. It means so much that you hold this um, community so close. Um, so thanks for, for letting uh, us be with you. A large fraction of the force, very important to our success. Bring, bring things that uh, uh, amplify our capabilities dramatically. And there's a lot more potential there I think we can unlock. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to do that with you. Thank you so much for your contributions today. It's a great conversation. Thank you.